Welcome to video one of the chemical reactions unit. We've seen chemical reactions both on paper and um, in the lab setting in this class, but now we're going to form formally learn how to write them out as um, chemical equations. So just to remind you what a chemical reaction is, it's a process where one or more substances are rearranged to form new substances. The first thing we're going to talk about are um, some indications or signs of a chemical reaction. So if you are going to be doing a lab assignment and I ask you to identify the signs of a chemical reaction, here are some of the things you're watching out for. You're trying to well, look out to see if a precipitation is formed in a reaction. A precipitate, um, sorry, a precipitate. A precipitate is formed when you have two liquids and then they form a solid um, when they react together. Now when I say a solid, sometimes a solid is not as obvious. Like this cloudy white opaque substance is a solid formed. So this was created from two clear liquids. If you mix two clear liquids and all of a sudden you see like an opaque thicker liquid formed, that's a precipitate. So look for something that's opaque. An opaque, O-P-A-Q-U-E, means you cannot see through it and um, it's like a th it's thicker than the original liquids and um, yeah it's thicker than the or original liquid. Now I have this term here suspension because eventually we're going to learn this word. A suspension means you have um, like two layers of liquid or like some substance floating on top of another sub um, like liquid and so that's just what that word suspension means. We haven't quite learned too much about that yet but we will. <clears throat> If you see a gas being formed between two reactants, that's also an indication of a chemical reaction. So um, this is an example like you mix two liquids together or you put a solid inside of a liquid like an effervescent tablet, for example. If you've ever seen effervescent tablets, you put it in water and all of a sudden bubbles formed. That is an indication a chemical reaction is forming. Um, a misconception here would be when you boil water. When you boil water, you do see bubbles, but the bubbles don't tell you that's a chemical reaction. Really you're just releasing the air bubbles from the liquid um, when you are boiling water. So I don't want you to think that that is a chemical reaction. There are three very typical gases that we form in a lab that would be carbon dioxide, oxygen, and hydrogen gas. And we can use something called a splint test where we use a little wooden stick and we light it on fire to identify the gas. Another indication of a chemical reaction is a permanent color change. So notice that in this um, picture you have a clear liquid coming out of the graduate cylinder, you have a clear liquid in the beaker, and when they are mixed together you see this opaque new colored substance inside. Now this is not only a permanent color change, but this is also an example of a precipitate being formed. So we have a yellow precipitate in this case. It's thicker, it's opaque, and um, that's an example of a precipitate as well as a color change. Whenever you have energy produced in the form of light, that's also an, an example or an indication that a chemical reaction is occurring. Like when you place pure sodium, not talking about um, like salt, but pure, pure sodium, which is in its metallic form, you put it into water and then it like lights, um, it creates like a small explosion. So um, depending on the amount that you have, of course. So this is an example of a chemical reaction occurring. Also, whenever you notice a temperature change. Now, a temperature change um, can either indicate an exothermic reaction or an endothermic reaction. You might remember these words from last semester. I want you to think about exo being uh, representing the term exiting. Thermic, like heat. So exothermic reactions mean that heat is exiting. And when you literally touch the outside of the container, it will feel warm to the touch. Endothermic means that heat, like thermic, is entering, so endo like enter, which means that when you literally touch the outside of a container, it feels colder than it originally did.
So sometimes when chemicals react, they either give off energy, which means they're exothermic, their um, heat is being released and they feel warm to the touch. And then if they're endothermic, they feel cool to the touch because the energy is actually being absorbed into the reaction, causing the container to feel colder. We use chemical equations in a way to represent reactions, and chemical equations are a lot like mathematical equations. Our chemical equations are going to use plus signs and arrows and chemical formulas to help shorten um, or abbreviate what's happening in an actual chemical reaction. We have substances called reactants. We also have things called products, and you definitely need to know those terms. A reactant are the things you start the reaction with. These are the things that you um, you are collecting in the very beginning of a lab assignment before you even mix them together. Those are your reactants. Your products are the things that you produce. These are the things you make at the end of a chemical reaction. This is a generic chemical equation. In a chemical equation, a lot like a math equation, we have plus signs to say that things are being added to each other. We have an arrow that represents a lot like how, what an equal sign represents to show you what you're actually being produced, what's actually being produced. The number of reactants and the number of products will vary. Here I have two reactants and two products, but you can have a one reactant and three products. You can have five reactants and one product. It just depends on the scenario of the actual um, reaction between the, uh, whatever you're mixing together. We have seen these large numbers before. These large numbers are what we call coefficients. These coefficients are larger. We write them in the front of our chemical formulas, and they are not to be confused with subscripts. The subscripts tell you the number of individual elements, sorry, not there, the number of individual elements, but the um, coefficient will tell you the number of units of the actual compound um, in the equation. So let me tell you what this equation represents. It tells you that there's one unit or one mole of copper and when you add it to two units or two moles of silver nitrate you would form one mole or one unit of copper two nitrate and you would also form two units of silver. So that is what this chemical equation represents. If I asked you to list the coefficients in a chemical equation, you would um, know that anytime we don't have a number, that's an understood one. So I'm going to list the coefficients of, as 1, 2, 1, 2. That's what the num that's, those are the numbers I have down here. So whenever you do not see a coefficient in front of a compound, that's an understood one. Whenever you are writing chemical equations, if you have a substance, you typically want to write a state of matter behind it. Now, I didn't do that in this example for the sake of space, but you would want to know, is copper a solid, liquid, or gas? Is AG a solid, liquid, or gas? And then we do have another option called aqueous, and I'll get to that in just a moment. And so um, sometimes I give you the state of matter, like I'll tell you it's a solid copper, but sometimes you just need to figure them out based off of context clues and other things. Acids will always be aqueous unless stated otherwise. Now the term aqueous means it's dissolved in water. So um, in, in reactions you typically don't have solid forms or pure forms of acid, you typically have them diluted in water. So that's why we would say that acids are aqueous unless stated otherwise. Metals um, are solid at room temperature, so I don't have to tell you I have solid copper because copper is a solid substance. So metals are solid at room temperature except mercury, which we know is a liquid at room temperature. Most diatomics are gases at room temperature. Um, I'll get to what a diatomic is in just a moment, and then um, I will get to this statement um, in just a moment too.
So when we describe chemical changes, we actually write chemical equations. Chemical equations are way more practical than having to write a paragraph out um, to describe what's happening. Like in math, for example, if I um, asked you to add 5 plus 1, I would not write F-I-V-E-P-L-U-S. I wouldn't write all of that out. Instead, I would use the number 5, a plus symbol, a 1, and so on. Chemical equations work the same way. But when we write chemical equations, there are a few things that will help us um, write it properly. So as the information is transferred from one person to another, it's pretty clear what was happening in um, the lab setting. We are going to talk about what Brinkelhoff is again. And Brinkelhoff is an acronym to help you remember your diatomic molecules. CL in Brinkelhoff represents chlorine, and that tells you that chlorine is never allowed to exist alone. So if you ever hear about chlorine gas, chlorine gas should always be represented as CL2, not just CL. Chlorine can be combined with other elements um, without having that subscript 2, so um, it just can't exist alone. And I just want to remind you that NaCl is the proper formula for sodium chloride because sodium has a plus 1 charge, chlorine has a negative 1 charge, and even though chlorine is a diatomic, that doesn't mean go ahead and throw a 2 behind chlorine every time you see it. That's only when it's by itself. Um, if an element's not combined with a different element, it's going to form a diatomic, which I just um, talked about and I will talk about again in the next slide. Here is what Brinkelhoff represents, or it's an acronym for. Bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. These are the elements that cannot exist alone. Uh, whenever you see something like bromine gas, um, nitrogen gas, chlorine gas, they always have to have a subscript of two next to it when they are by themselves. If they're combined with another element, you already know how to write formulas. We spent a whole unit on that. But when they're by themselves, you need to have a subscript. So these are the diatomic elements placed on your periodic table. They might they make a nice little seven here on um, this non-metal side of the periodic table, but don't forget about hydrogen. And one word of caution, don't include carbon. Sometimes when people say Brinkelhoff, they'll hear that k sound and think it's carbon, but it's not. Here are the symbols used in reactions. This is on your paper also. Whenever you see a plus symbol, that means that you're adding things together, just like in math class. Um, the arrow is in the middle of your chemical equation. This is your separator of before and after a reaction. So this can represent the word yields, forms, produces. There are lots and lots of synonyms or words that mean the same thing to represent um, this arrow. If you see a double arrow, that means we have a reversible reaction. The reaction can go forward as well as backwards. We have S, L, and G in parentheses to represent our solid liquids and gases, and we also have AQ in parentheses. AQ means aqueous, sometimes pronounced aqueous, but aqueous means that you have a substance that is dissolved in water. Like if I have NaCl, with an AQ on the back of the formula, that means I have salt dissolved in water. If I were to add a triangle on top of this arrow, that tells you that heat is supplied to the reaction, which actually doesn't mean the same thing as something being burned. Being burned can just mean a combustion reaction, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're heating something up with a hot plate or a Bunsen burner. So um, if heat is being supplied like through a Bunsen burner or through a hot plate, you would put this triangle on top of your arrow. You would draw an arrow pointing down next to a chemical formula if a precipitate is being formed. Like if you form a solid from two liquids, um, you can use this down arrow or you could simply use the S in parentheses. If a gas is being released, you can draw an up arrow next to the chemical formula of that substance that um, is a gas or you can simply use the G in parentheses. If pressure is applied to a reaction, you would write the word pressure above this arrow. And then if a catalyst is being applied, a catalyst is something that will speed up the reaction, but it isn't necessarily used up in the reaction, you would write the chemical equation of the catalyst and put it on top of this arrow as well.
You do need to know these symbols, and then again, all acids should be aqueous unless stated otherwise. So that is everything you need to complete set one. Set one, set one is relatively simple, but you also have set two to work on. Both of the sets are really short, so don't be bummed out that you have two sets. Um, but let me go ahead and show you how to complete set two because it's not just um, something you can look at and figure out on your own. So in set two, you're trying to identify the um, ionic compounds as being either soluble or insoluble. So if you have an ionic compound, you need a, a list of the solubility rules, and this image can be found on the back of your periodic table. So if you don't have your periodic table out, then go ahead and have that um, get that out before you work on set two. The word insoluble, so you'll see the term insoluble here. It means that it will not dissolve in water, which means when you put this substance into water, it's going to um, be a solid or remain a solid or create a solid, like a precipitate, um, in water. The word soluble means it will dissolve in water. It will go into the solution, completely mix with water, and that's what we would consider an aqueous solution in the end. We can represent that as AQ in parentheses. So this is how you read this chart. You are going to notice that most of the things on this list of soluble and insoluble are anions. You do see one cation there, and that's ammonium, but for the most part, you're going to see the anions. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to look at the name of a chemical compound. Okay, an ionic compound to be more specific. You're going to look at the name of it and you're going to use this chart and find its anion to see if it's either soluble or if it's insoluble. However, with chemistry, we always have exceptions. So let's say I gave you an example like ammonium chloride. Ammonium is NH4. If I asked you if ammonium chloride is soluble or insoluble, you would find ammonium or chloride. So if you found ammonium here, you would say, oh, okay, ammonium chloride is soluble because there are no exceptions. You could have also looked at the chloride part, Cl minus, and saw that, okay, ammonium chloride. If chloride is listed here, it must be soluble, but let me check the exceptions. Ammonium is not listed here as an exception, therefore, it would be soluble. I'll give you an example from your um, set two now. In set two, the first example, or one of the examples, is sodium phosphate. So what we're going to do is we're going to look for the anion, phosphate, and here's phosphate. If you forgot your um, anion names, remember that right next to this chart, to the left of it, is the um, polyatomic ion list. So here's phosphate. At first glance, sodium phosphate is going to appear to be an insoluble substance. So um, Phosphates are generally insoluble, however, we want to check the exceptions, and the exceptions tell us that the compounds of NH4, if there's NH4 in the formula, or if there's an alkali metal cation, then it was an exception. Now, sodium is an alkali metal cation. Um, alkali metals, if you need to make a little note right here on your formula card, an alkali metal is in group one of your periodic table. And since sodium is in group one, it's not going to be insoluble. It's going to be the opposite. It's going to be soluble. So the way you read this list, your final answer, by the way, is soluble. The way you read this chart is if it's listed here, it's going to be soluble. Listed here, it's insoluble, but if it's an exception, if the cation is listed as an exception, it's the opposite. So in this case, our sodium phosphate with the alkali metal is going to be soluble. At this point, go ahead and work on set one and set two. Like I said, they are relatively short. You probably could get them done before the end of the period. They are each going to get a separate stamp. So if you come in tomorrow or you do decide not to work on either set one or both set one and set two, it's really, really